The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, my name is James. Welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. In this episode, we're going to enter the spectral domain. No, not ghost. I'm talking about the frequency domain. This video shows you the basics of using a spectrum analyzer to look at spectral or frequency content of electronic signals. Now, spectrum analyzers can measure many things and they have many controls. My goal with this video is to show you the basic controls you need to use any spectrum analyzer. And if you stick with me to the end, I'm going to briefly show you how to make all kinds of cool measurements with one. Let's start with a quick explanation on the difference between time domain and frequency domain. If we look at a sine wave in the time domain, you will see a shape like this one. And that's because we're looking at voltage across time. In the frequency domain, the sine wave is a single peak. And that is because it is one frequency with a certain amplitude or power. Now, if we change our waveform to a square wave, like a digital signal, then we see a major difference in the frequency domain. Now there are multiple peaks for that waveform. And that's because a square wave is made up of multiple sine waves of various frequencies. When we talk about a spectrum analyzer on our workbench, we usually mean more of the radio frequency or RF type like this one. Spectrum analyzers make sweep measurements. They start at one frequency and then sweep through measuring the power of individual frequency points. The center of the screen is the center frequency, which in this case is 1.5 GHz. The left is our start frequency and the right is the stop frequency. Between them is the span, which in this case is 3 GHz. Vertically, the analyzer plots amplitude as decibels relative to 1 mW or dBm. The top is the reference level or the highest power that can be measured. For now, let's focus on the trace. Around this area, we see an occasional spur, and that's occurring at 2.4 gigahertz. Hmm, Wi-Fi uses 2.4 gigahertz, doesn't it? I'm actually connected to my spectrum analyzer over Wi-Fi, so why don't we see a constant peak? Think about that for a second while I zoom in. Now we are looking at 2.442 GHz or Wi-Fi channel 7 with a span of about 75 MHz. That roughly covers channels 1 through 14. Wi-Fi uses frequency hopping, which we can actually see happening now with all these pulses showing up. Remember, a spectrum analyzer sweeps across frequency. It can only measure one specific frequency at a time. So when we had the full span at 3 GHz, we are missing frequency hops as the analyzer scanned by. By zooming in, we increase the chance to capture activity. Tell you what, to make understanding how to use an analyzer easier, we're going to use a device that transmits constantly on a single frequency. Despite all of these buttons, there are only four controls you need to know in order to use any spectrum analyzer. Just by using frequency, span, amplitude or reference level, and resolution bandwidth, we are going to find the frequency and modulation type used by my microphone transmitter. Now, you probably don't have one of these to follow along with, and that's okay. You can use just a function generator and input something like a sine wave. Just make sure you keep the voltage below one volt or zero dBm. Here's an example where I measured a 20 megahertz sine wave before I started the video. Now, first, we need to get our signal into the analyzer, and usually you would use cables to attach to the N-type connector. For our exercise, I'm using this small antenna. It has an SMA connector on it, which will not directly mate to the N-type connector. 
so I'll have to use an adapter. Now, when using adapters, please be careful and don't twist the mated surfaces. What you should do instead is twist the threaded sleeve. What you might notice is that I do a counterclockwise turn and then go clockwise before I start to tighten. This prevents thread skipping from happening. Ideally, I should use a torque wrench to secure these connections, but I lost my torque wrench and I forgot to order a new one from the Element 14 community. So here's an example of one to use with brass SMA connectors. Stainless steel uses a different torque. But for three gigahertz measurements, we are fine just to use our fingers. The one thing I do wanna say is absolutely do not ever use pliers on an RF connector. Okay, let's go measure some RF. The preset button puts the analyzer into a known state and causes it to sweep its entire frequency range. The first thing we need to check is that there are no spurs going above the screen. To fix this, we'll use amplitude and change the reference level by moving it down just a little bit. There we go. If we look closer to the top of the screen, there is an indicator called REF and one called ATT. REF is the reference level, which right now is negative 10 dBm. ATT stands for attenuation. In this case, we are attenuating the signal by 10 dB. And so the way we moved the reference level was to actually reduce the signal. There's also an indicator called PA on this analyzer, which stands for preamplifier. This analyzer has a preamplifier built in, but you can also get external preamplifiers to use with a spectrum analyzer. Those are very useful when you're working with very small signals, like those that you might get from a near field probe. You would use this probe to like look for EMI problems. Now, I believe this peak is my microphone. To verify, I'm just gonna turn my microphone off. To me, reading a spectrum analyzer screen isn't all that intuitive. You sort of have to do math to figure out where all the frequencies are. So to find the value of this peak, I'm just going to turn on a marker. The cool thing is markers usually just snap to the highest peak on the display. And in this case, I can see the number is 565.989 megahertz, which is a number we will need in the next step. Since we are measuring frequency, we should talk about how to change the frequency. Setting the frequency lets you set the center frequency. Now, from the marker, we know that we want a frequency of 565.9 megahertz. Notice our spur snapped to the center of the screen and our span changed a little bit. From here, we'll use the span control to zoom in on that peak. And while it is getting bigger, that's kind of slow. So I'm just going to type in 100 megahertz. Now the amplitude looks pretty good, so we're ready to move on. I would like you to pay attention to the shape of this trace as I go to 10 megahertz. Notice two things happened. One, the shape of the trace changed. And two, our center moved a little bit from the center of the screen. I'll explain why that happened later. For now, let's use the marker and remeasure what the frequency is and then recenter it. 566.22 megahertz. Okay, now let's go down one more step to one megahertz for the span. Span one megahertz. Now the trace has more noise and it's shifted again. So instead of recentering it, Let's measure the bandwidth of this signal and set the span one last time. I'll turn on a second marker and move it to the right of the pulse and then move the first marker to the left. The second marker I turned on is called a delta marker. It measures the difference between the first marker and itself. And we can see that it's measuring a width of 180 kilohertz. So let's just set the span to something a little bit larger, like 200 kilohertz. At this point, you have to be wondering, why does the magic span button change the shape of the trace so much? I promise, I'm going to explain. For the moment, I am stopping the sweep so we can clearly see what the trace looks like. Now, the first thing I wanna do is verify where our peak is one last time. And I'm gonna start by turning off the second marker 
And then on the first marker, I'm going to set it to peak. Okay, now we'll set our frequency to 566.22497 megahertz. And notice that the center frequency is 556.225, which is the exact frequency of my transmitter. From this trace, I know the transmitter's carrier frequency and I see a single set of sidebands generated from it. The overall shape tells me the signal is frequency modulated or FM with a low modulation index. Measuring the sidebands would even tell us how much bandwidth this transmitter uses. Unfortunately, I can't get into the details of modulation schemes in this video, but I wanted to show you an example where we are using the analyzer to verify the operation of a literal black box. Okay, now let's back up and talk about why did that wave shape or trace change as we change the span. For that, first we need to talk about the spectrum analyzer's block diagram. Do you remember the good old days when you would listen to the local morning disc jockeys on your super heterodyne receiver? Well, if you don't recognize that phrase, maybe the term FM radio is more familiar. And if you don't know that one, then well, it's what came before Spotify. Heterodyning is a signal processing technique that shifts a signal from one frequency range into another. Spectrum analyzers use that same technology or idea to measure the power of frequency components in a signal. Inside the analyzer is a mixer and local oscillator. The mixer mixes the signal under test with a signal from the local oscillator. That process creates a lower frequency called the intermediate frequency or IF. The signal then passes through a filter before a detector measures it. So far, that only measures one frequency point. To build up the spectrum analyzer's display, a sweep generator changes the local oscillator's frequency. So as the LO sweeps through a range, the detector sees different frequency components, which is what gets plotted on the analyzer screen. Coming back to this IF filter, all filters have a bandwidth associated with them. The key to why the waveform change shape as we change span is because the analyzer automatically changed the bandwidth of the IF filter. The analyzer calls this the resolution bandwidth or RBW. If the RBW is too wide, then overlapping frequency components get combined. By reducing RBW and increasing the frequency points, we get more resolution on our screen. As you might imagine, the tighter the RBW, the longer the sweep takes. Okay, let's get back to our example. Pay attention to the RBW indicator. It is currently at three kilohertz. When I set the span back to one megahertz, notice that the RBW now goes to 30 kilohertz. These span changes cause the RBW to change by an order of magnitude, but we can manually control the RBW. When I press bandwidth, RBW is selected, and now I'm going to go all the way down to 100 hertz. Notice that the screen is updating about once a second. In fact, if you look at the SWT indicator, that's what it's measuring right now. That's our sweep time. Now these peaks are really too tight for us to see anything. We'd have to actually go back and change the span down to 200 kilohertz. Now our display becomes more lively and we seem to have a little bit more data that we can see. As you can tell, the span, the resolution bandwidth, and the sweep time are all sort of connected together. Changing one will affect the others, which will probably lead you to ask, what should you set the resolution bandwidth to? If you're new to a spectrum analyzer, I suggest leaving it on the automatic setting. The last control is one you will rarely need to change on a modern spectrum analyzer. After all the measurements get done, a filter is applied to just the visual trace. To demonstrate, I've changed the resolution bandwidth back to 30 kilohertz. Now, I'll put the video bandwidth into manual and set it to three kilohertz. And we can see that the signal gets much cleaner to look at. So this filter is just visual. Measurements won't be affected. 
the analyzer will try to set a video bandwidth that does not impact the sweep time. For that reason, you will usually not touch it. If you're making measurements against a specific standard, it may call out a video bandwidth, and in that case, you'll want to set it to manual. But out of all of the controls we talked about, rarely should you need to change the video bandwidth or the sweep time. Okay, let's go back and review those four main controls. Since we covered a lot in this basics video, I wanted to review one more time the four basic controls you need to be able to use a spectrum analyzer. Number zero, preset. Then check the reference amplitude to make sure the signal is not going off screen. Next, set your center frequency. And then set the span. From here, double check that the amplitude still looks good and then decide if you want to change the resolution bandwidth or not. And that's it. So before we wrap up, I want to show you some advanced measurements that a spectrum analyzer are capable of. So check these out. Hello, my name is James. I'm also known as the Bald Engineer. And now you know what my voice looks like on a spectrogram. The radio wave, sir. We're passing through an old-style distress signal. As you can see, a spectrum analyzer is capable of showing you tons of useful information about a signal. And while I wish I could show you even more of its capabilities, this video would have gotten even longer. Remember, over on Element 14, you'll find notes for this episode, which includes information about the FPC 1500, which I used in this episode. And there's even road test reviews of this spectrum analyzer from Element 14 community members. I'll also include a few things related to spectrum analyzers. If you want to ask me questions, that's the best place because I'll actually see them. For now, I'm going to get back to peak detecting spectral components on my electronics workbench.